they were undisciplined as soldiers. We say that there was an army. There wasn't an army. There was a gaggle. These men are ragged, getting drunk on duty. It was a mess. Up against the world's strongest empire. The British are certain they can swat these militia away like pesky flies. Americans lost battle after battle. The British make the assumption that a simple show of force will be enough to scare rebels back to their senses. The question Britain is asking is, why isn't this thing over yet? This should have been an easy victory. Boston, 1765. Lately, life in the colonies has been relatively tranquil. Certainly it has for Thomas Hutchinson. A fifth generation Bostonian, Hutchinson has enjoyed good fortune and political success. The king has appointed him chief justice and lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. For years, Thomas Hutchinson has been one of the colony's most admired citizens. Until now. Hutchinson's life is about to take a dramatic and ugly turn. An angry mob is surging through Boston. Hutchinson is about to find out that he's the man thereafter. He's the man in charge of the intolerable new policies imposed on the colonies by their British rulers, tax policies that have incited an increasingly violent rebellion among the people. A rebellion against a tax imposed not by their own local representatives, but by Parliament 3,000 miles away in England. Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson is duty bound to enforce this controversial new tax. Though he personally opposes it, he is being denounced as a traitor. Massachusetts has never seen a mob as violent as this. They're not just angry about the money. They're angry at the assault on their autonomy by English rulers who neither know them nor represent them. The revolt spreads like an epidemic through all 13 colonies. It's hard to imagine that the fallout from this tax will ignite a social revolution unlike any the world has ever seen. Across the Atlantic, England's King George III is losing his patience. His colonies are acting like petulant children. These are his subjects, Englishmen, born in America, but Englishmen just the same. He is their ruler, and it's because of them that his empire is going broke. A decade ago, he sent British troops across the ocean to defend the colonies against French settlers and their Indian allies. The war went on for seven years, and it cost England 60 million pounds, money it now desperately needs. There's a sense that after the Seven Years' War that um, America ought to pay its way a little bit. That expenses to protect North America should in part be raised in North America. Parliament's solution is unprecedented. The Stamp Act of 1765 directly taxes colonies by having them pay for stamps that must be affixed to virtually every piece of paper they touch, from official documents to playing cards. It is the first time ever that Parliament has levied a tax on the American colonies. It goes badly from the start. The colonists resent not only paying the tax, but also having it imposed by a faraway Parliament where no one represents them. Though the Crown appoints colonial governors and high officials, each colony is long accustomed to ruling itself and levying its own taxes. The Americans believed that over 150 years of being colonists, they had in a sense created a nation within the British Empire. They had free assemblies, democratically elected. They had free and independent and very good newspapers. They had a, their own tax system. 
it wasn't just paying a little bit of money. The notion was that other people were making them pay money. So it's an emotional issue. Who's in control here? We want to control our own lives, which includes, of course, our own pocketbooks. In 1765, a new generation of colonists is rushing headlong down an uncharted path to an unknown end, and the Stamp Act is what starts it. Much of the spirit, if not the exact words, is don't you see what they're up to? Don't you see what's going on? There's a strategy at work here to gradually erode American liberties. If you let them do this, what will they try to do next? For the British, the tax isn't about eroding liberties, it's about money. Stoking the colonial reaction is a powerful underground movement known as the Sons of Liberty. They meet secretly in taverns across the colonies and come up with every tactic they can to keep government officials from collecting England's tax. People really started forming alliances between kind of street theater, street gangs, and merchants and artisans, and figuring out ways uh, to all work towards the common cause, which is to repeal the Stamp Act. Soon enough, things begin to get ugly. Intimidation is a favorite weapon. Those who remain loyal to the king, known as loyalists or Tories, often find themselves terrorized by these self-anointed patriots. They often use very dramatic techniques, tar and feathering, for instance. This is a, a great way to humiliate people. First, you're stripped naked. The bucket of tar is heated, and you're coated with tar. And then they put these feathers, these goose feathers, all over you, and you're all hot, and you're branching about like a silly goose. After a display like this, how is this person going to publicly oppose the Patriot position? A loyalist printer in New York City who publishes a Loyalist newspaper. And they come in and smash his printing press while they are also proclaiming free speech as a principle to fight for. That's the nature of war and the nature of revolution. While the angry rabble takes to the streets, men of property and education use printing presses and politics to denounce the Stamp Act tax. One of the most outspoken is 29-year-old John Adams, a bright, ambitious attorney who brings logic and intellect to this very emotional argument. He drafts anti-tax resolutions for some 40 Massachusetts assemblies. We have always understood it to be a grand and fundamental principle of the English Constitution that no free man should be subject to any tax to which he has not given his own consent. John Adams. Adams has always envisioned great things for himself, and the cause of liberty presents the opportunity of a lifetime. His wife, Abigail, is his trusted confidant and partner in all things, great and small. I think it's hard to overestimate the importance of Abigail Adams. I mean, not only is she more than an equal partner um, to her husband, but she comes to this contest with really perfectly formed ideas about which she feels passionately. She's an enormous influence on her husband. One day, these two will be counted among the founders of a new nation. For now, John Adams is one of many voices of protest in a Stamp Act rebellion that engulfs all 13 colonies. Down in Virginia, a fiery young legislator named Patrick Henry ups the ante. Resolved that the inhabitants of this colony are not bound to yield obedience to any law or ordinance designed to impose any taxation whatsoever other than the laws of their own General Assembly. Patrick Henry. In other words, no taxation without representation. Henry's Virginia resolves become a radical touchstone for all the colonies. Three thousand miles away in London, another important player in the colonial drama, America's Benjamin Franklin, is doing what he does best, playing chess, flirting with a pretty young thing, and keeping an eye on developments for his countrymen. 
Franklin becomes the point man. He is the man in England who is there essentially trying to hammer out some kind of compromise on issues of taxation with the crown. At 59, Franklin is the most famous American in the world. He has spent the better part of two decades in England as a trade representative and the colony's unofficial ambassador, wooing and wowing a London society with his wit and wisdom. This is the Philadelphia printer and writer who created Poor Richard's Almanac, the colony's best-selling annual, rich with homespun advice. He is the scientist who famously flew a kite to experiment with electricity, who invented the lightning rod and the bifocal. A self-made man who went from lowly apprentice to wealthy entrepreneur, Franklin is the embodiment of what it means to be an American. Yet he adores England, the mother country, and especially London. He's absolutely in his element. This is where the great center of science is at this point. It's, it's, a, it's like being in the city as opposed to having been in the country. He's really hit uh, the right group of people. And he's very much, he, he raised these down as the happiest years of his life. Now the uprising at home has put Franklin at center stage, a place he generally enjoys. London's baffled politicians come pounding on his door, desperate for a solution to the problem hoping he can use his considerable influence to bring the colonists to their senses. But it's business, not politics, that settles the matter. The decisive blow is the blow to the British pocketbook. North American merchants said, well, okay, while the Stamp Act is in place, we're just not going to trade with you. It's a way of getting merchants in England to say, if this is going to ruin business, then the Stamp Act's got to go. Now England's merchants and bankers are feeling the pinch from the loss of business created by colonial boycotts, and they too start railing against the Stamp Act. The tax crisis has become just too big a headache, and in March 1766, a beleaguered parliament finally repeals the Stamp Act. Unbelievably, the people of the colonies have forced the world's greatest power to back down. The rebel colonists can celebrate their first sweet taste of victory and of power. But the battles are far from over. England still needs the money and still needs to show who's boss. Over the next four years, Parliament devises new taxes, which trigger renewed upheaval and end up being repealed. As this seemingly endless cycle continues, England dispatches two military regiments to Massachusetts from New York to keep order, adding fuel to the fire. In 1768, four more regiments sail from England on a collision course with America.